Well, good morning and welcome to Central. We're so happy to have you here this morning. And whether this was an easy decision or a difficult one to choose to be here this morning, we want to say thank you for choosing that. We believe that is a good decision. A good decision to be here together with those um, who want to hear from the Lord, who want to open His Word, want to take communion together. And so we are happy to have you. Um, this morning as we get started, one of the things that we value here at Central is that, that we don't just come and listen, but we can actually see the faces of and meet the people that we're doing church together with. And so if you wouldn't mind, if you would stand up and if you would say hi, uh, greet some people around you, it take about 30 seconds to do that. As you make your way back to your seat, um, we, we want to make sure that, that today is a time where you can tune in to what's happening. And so just for you to know the kind of the flow of the service today, uh, today communion is going to happen at the end of the service, and we typically have it at the beginning. Um, but we're going we're gonna to sing praises to our Lord, and we're going to hear from His Word and a message, and then we'll close our time together with communion. And, and as we often say here at Central, we want to encourage you as we sing songs of praise that they are more than just words on a screen. They are more than just songs. They can become our prayers to our Lord. As we can together sing phrases that are true about who He is and who we are, we think that's a powerful way to pray prayers of praise. And so as we begin that, would you pray together with me? Holy Father, thank you for this time. We want to take advantage of it. Uh, we want to know you more. Uh, we want to be obedient to your truth and your word. So help us to pay attention. Help us to watch for where you're leading. God, thank you for moments like this where we can slow down from the normal things of our week and put our attention and our focus on you. We praise you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus reigns, I know, I know. Nations bow, mountains shake at the sound of just one name. Over all, Jesus reigns. sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Sing this with me. Blessing and honor
the highest throng Welcomed by a melody An anthem I have always known A song that's always been in me All glory and honor, dominion and power to you Angels fall face down on the floor, all to echo, holy is the Lord. My heart can't help but sing with all of heaven roar, forever echo, holy is the Lord. Oh 
We will be in Acts chapter 17 today. Um, I want to encourage you to turn there in your Bibles or find it on your device, however you choose to follow along. We're going to be in the last half of Acts chapter 17 is where we're going to focus. And we're going to pick up in verse 16. Let me read the text for you. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? And others remarked, he seems to be advocating a foreign God. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all of the nations and that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear more Uh, We want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Uh, I have a rock here, and uh, it's it's a special rock. Um, This rock sits in my office on the shelf. Um, This is from the Areopagus. Uh, My world traveler friend, Ben, um, took this when he was in Athens and brought it to me, um, and it's special to me. Um, I think he committed an international crime when he did that, so the rock may be hot, um, which makes it even more exciting. Um, But this is important to me because it is one of those pieces of history that comes from a very important passage for me. This... Um, this passage of scripture where Paul gives his apology for the faith in an academic setting um, has been significant in my spiritual formation. It means something to me because it comes from this passage of scripture. It's a big deal what Paul does here.
as a Roman citizen, he would, have, he would, he would know that Athens is the birthplace of philosophy. It, it was the cultural hub of the Roman Empire. It, it is um, what happened in Greece, what happened in Athens, um, has had uh, impact around the world for millennia. Paul would have known these things as a Roman citizen. It, it's the birthplace of philosophy and medicine and intellectualism and the academics, and it was the birthplace of democracy. Um, the city, while under control of Rome, was allowed to exercise freely. They, they were given um, the status that was different from all of the other conquered people and lands. Uh, they were allowed to operate as an ally to Rome with their own freedom. Athens was the academic center of the world. It was the home of Plato and Aristotle. It was the home of Epicurus and um, Socrates and Zeno, the great philosophers. It was the city of the gods with temples and shrines to all of the Greek gods. It was a city that was open to new ideas and ideologies. They were the think tank of the known world. In Athens, you could be whatever you wanted to be. Any philosophical approach would work. In Athens, you could be anything that was new culturally, um, new ideologies, new religions, new theologies, new philosophies. And in Athens, um, there was this sense of elitism. They, they were the academics. They were, um, they were the Ivy League, if you will. And when we read of Athens and the apology that Paul gives for the faith, there is probably no greater parallel uh, from Scripture of our cultural um, condition here in America. Every religious creed and cult was represented, and if it wasn't, it would be. Every philosophical approach had been considered, and if it hadn't, it would be. It, it was a place that promoted intellect and science. In fact, it was Athens where the atomic theory was first created, by the guy that created democracy, by the way. Democritus um, didn't go very far from that name, did we? Um, 2,000 years before the scientific community picked up the idea that there may be smaller particles in all of us that are, that are moving and active, um, it was pitched as an idea in Athens. There were two schools of thought, at least in our story today, the, the school of Epicurus and Zeno. Zeno were the Stoics, which literally just means the people of the porch. That's where they discussed their issues. In the Epicurean school, the ultimate goal was pleasure, and, and not the raucous debauchery that we normally talk about when we, when we say we're seeking pleasure, but, but rather it was the kind of pleasure that is the absence of hardship and pain, a spiritual and emotional and physical life that was free from hardship and difficulty. And in this philosophical approach, the gods have established the nature of things, but they don't have time to intervene in human affairs. For the Stoics, the pursuit was of virtue and duty. That was the paramount value. Our existence is to harmonize with what has been created, to do what is right, and to make life better, and to be um, all about our society and our culture. Pleasure, the absence of pain and hardship, is a byproduct of a virtuous life, not the goal. For the Stoics, they would teach that you can endure hard things even if there is pain. Theologically, the gods were part of the world's soul, kind of a, a new age um, religion, uh, that God is in everything and the gods are, are part of all things. And these two schools of thought were at odds with one another. And, but in Athens, they were a place where everyone was seeking knowledge and truth and validity. And the result was that no one understood the truth that would set them free. They were living with a never-ending identity crisis. Whatever is new, whatever wind of doctrine, whatever theology comes our way, that's what we will talk about. And I think very much like our culture today, they needed to hear the truth. So I want to make three observations for you from this story and Paul's interaction um, with the men of Athens. 
The first is this, that Paul was moved by what he saw. Verse 16 says, Paul was waiting for them in Athens, and he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. The the city was full of idolatry. While we might travel to Athens and look at the architecture and the artwork and the sculptures and read of the history and be enamored by all of the aesthetically pleasing things that we would see that have survived throughout antiquity, Paul wasn't seeing that as art and as aesthetically pleasing. That wasn't the purpose. Paul was recognizing this in the culture of his day as idolatry. John Stott says that that, that more accurately than um, the city was full of idolatry, it was that the city was under idolatry, that it was oppressive how much there was there. Every God, every theme, every religion, every doctrine had a shrine or an altar or a temple or a statue Uh, They literally were swamped with idolatry. It was oppressive. Us less sophisticated folks would say you couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting an idol in Athens. It was overwhelmingly covered up by every deity that you could imagine. And Paul is distressed by that. The the word distressed here is, is only used one other time in the New Testament. It's used in 1 Corinthians 13. It's used to describe this this value, this characteristic of love. Love is not easily angered. It's the same word. It's only used twice in the New Testament. It's this idea, and it's not so much about being angry because, you know, she burned the pot roast or angry because he didn't trim the lawn. It's it's anger that that wells up within you. It's this tension that builds until it kind of comes out. It's actually a medical term. And it's used to describe the seizure that happens. When all the tension builds up and then your body releases in a seizure, it is this tension and this turmoil and this distress. But I don't think Paul's angry. I think if you go back and look in the Septuagint where this word appears multiple times, it is used, it, it, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures, it's used to describe God's response to idolatry. You remember the second commandment? You shall make no graven images, nothing of gold or silver or wood or stone, and worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So when, when we see throughout Israel's history that they would create idols and they would bow down and they would worship them, it, it, it comes out with this word, there's distress from the Lord that word is usually translated, God was provoked. There's something that is stirring in Paul as he sees these things that make him uneasy. Isaiah 42, verse 6, says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. This is the kind of thing that provokes God to action, that stirs him up. And I think what's going on here is Paul is disturbed by the same things that God is disturbed by. That as a follower of the Most High, what provokes him also provokes Paul. The things that are distressing and provocative to the Lord should be distressing and provocative to his people. And as I read through uh, this section, Paul doesn't become angry or provoked by the people of Athens. Rather, he was distressed to see that their efforts uh, of art and worship and intellect and thought had been wasted on false gods. And Paul is moved by what he sees in a way that manifests itself in his mission. He's moved by the distress of the idolatry in a way that calls him, pushes him, provokes him to mission. Do you remember what that mission is? He writes about it, Romans chapter 10. He says, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? 
it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And Paul is stirred in his soul with the kind of provocation that God stirs up when there is idolatry and he is called to action. And Paul does what Paul does. He preaches the good news. Second observation is this. He meets them on their terms. See that in verse 17 and 18. First, Paul goes to the synagogue. It's it's the same scenario that we've heard over and over and over. Paul goes to the synagogue. He begins to reason there with the Jews and with the God-fearing Greeks. And he tells the story of the historical Jesus who checks all of the boxes of scripture. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the Christ. He has come and fulfilled all prophecy. And you can trust in him. And and to put the icing on the cake, the, the, the cherry on top, God raised him from the dead to prove that he was who he said he was. That's that's the sermon that is preached in the synagogues. But we also see that Paul heads into the Agora to reason with people on a daily basis. He's in the synagogue on the Sabbath, but but he's in the marketplace on the daily. The, The Agora, it's where we get our term agoraphobia for those of you who deal with social anxiety, the big crowds being caught having to give a speech, that anxiety that comes, that comes from this place in Athens, the fear of that wide open space. Paul heads in there and he begins to reason. His distress did not end in condemnation and rebuke. He didn't walk around with a sign that said, you know, you're going to hell. It ended with Paul preaching the gospel to anyone who would give an ear. For the Jews, it was the historical Jesus, but in the marketplace, Paul meets them on their turf. It takes on reasoning. The Greek word there is dialegomai. It's transliterated for us in the English language, dialogue. It is this idea that Paul would use in the birthplace of philosophy, the Socratic method, questions and answers discussion and dialogue. He he would ask questions. He would engage in conversation, and it was a two-way street. He didn't stand up and preach a sermon in the marketplace. He reasoned with them. And it was in this context that the academics engaged Paul Now, I mentioned that there's a little bit of uh, this academic elitism. If you're an academic, please forgive me. I don't mean you. I mean all the other academics, right? There's this sense that um, with the academics that, well, I have the degree. I'm educated. I speak the language. I'm an expert in the field. I can be trusted because of what's hanging on my wall. There there was this uh, little bit of academic elitism in the way they engage Paul in the marketplace, The first is this. They say, what is this babbler talking about? We have a granddaughter who's beginning to make noises. It's amazing to me the things that grandparents will do to get a coo, a smile. Um, I have become a babbler in order to get some babbles, right? But the word here, this... um, Um, John Stott says that this was an Athenian slang and an Athenian slam. The word babbler is um, used to describe a seed picker, which was a bird that would go and and take some of the food from over here and some of the food from over here and some of the food from over here and some of the food from over here. And and the, the terminology was a lot of folks came to Athens thinking that they were one of them, that they were an academic, and they would take a little bit of this philosophy and a little bit of that philosophy and a little bit of this religion and a little bit of this idea, and they would package it and call it something new. So when they say, what is this babbler talking about? It's not that they don't understand. It's that they recognize the bits and pieces of Paul's philosophy and his religion because they've seen it in all these other places, and he's not coming up with something new. He's just trying to package a new product so that he can sell His version. The other thought is that maybe it is a new religion. Here's the interesting thing. Um, The commentary says that that just a couple of chapters ago, when Paul and Barnabas were preaching the gospel, they thought it was the old religion that Zeus and Hermes had come to them. 
And now they're saying, oh, it's something completely new, something about the resurrection. There is a need for us to be very clear when talking to those who come from pagan backgrounds. And so the academics invite Paul to the Areopagus to, to share his new ideas. The Areopagus, the, the, the place of Ares, the Greek god of war. It was the place for debates and, and for battles. And historically, it had been the place um, where there was maybe some judicial stuff going on. That doesn't seem to be the case here. The god of war, by the way, for the Romans was Mars. And so you may have heard of the Mars Hill discussion. That is this place. But the fascinating thing is that Paul is meeting them on their terms. Paul is meeting them on their turf. Paul goes to talk to the religious people in the religious setting, and he goes to talk to the common people in the marketplace, and he goes to Mars Hill, to the Areopagus, to talk to the academics. And what is fascinating to me is that the gospel fits in every one of those circumstances. That the gospel is for religious people and the gospel is for lost people and the gospel is for smart people and educated people. The gospel is for people who would reason and the gospel is for people who would believe. And Paul does this masterful thing throughout chapter 17 where he meets them on their turf, on their territory, on their terms, with their language. It's kind of like what he said to the church in Corinth. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, that's these folks here, I became like one not having the law. Though I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under the Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this all for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Paul is disturbed by what he sees and he meets them on their terms so that he can become all things to all people so that he might save some. Why? For the sake of the gospel. That is enough so that he might share in their blessings. And so Paul takes the gospel to the places who had not heard. He shares freedom with those who thought they understood freedom. Here's the third observation. Paul preached the truth. He was disturbed. He goes to them on their turf. And he preaches the truth. In many of the instances where Paul gives his apology or the defense of his faith, he is under indictment or interrogation, right? Tell us what your reason is or else we're going to throw rocks at you until you're dead. Tell us why you're preaching in this name or we're going to flog you. But it appears that in this council, he is the invited guest. Um, while there are, there are no real justice ramifications for him from a political or from a judicial sense, um, it is possible that these were the folks that would give him uh, the punch card so that he could preach in the town square. As Luke records Paul's speech, it appears to be a bit more of a TED Talk, if you will. Um, it, it's short, it's sweet, it's to the point. There are some in, in our academic circles who would say, well, this wasn't really a defense of the gospel. Um, he didn't present the gospel. He, he, didn't, he didn't give the whole story here. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but he didn't say anything about the cross. That's kind of a pivotal point. But I think that Paul as an orator is masterful in the way that he presents a defense of his faith, I think that he is masterful and that this is the hook. This, this, is, this is the bread on the water to see what's going to take the bait. He's masterful in, in how he begins his speech. I was walking around and I saw an altar to an unknown God and what you were ignorant about, it's not a, it's not a slam, it's what you don't understand or know I'm going to proclaim to you. You're already worshiping the God that I'm going to reveal. And everybody has to lean in now. 
because they all know this was not uncommon to have that altar to an unknown God. And so Paul gives a five-point message. Sounds like a college pastor. God is the creator of all things was his first point. It's the teleological argument, if you want to get into the apologetic scene, it's the, that the design requires a designer. It's the argument of the watchmaker. If you're walking along in the forest and you find a watch on the ground, um, you would assume that because there is this creative design, that there is something that has been created and built and put together, that there is a creator. It's the existence of creation that points us to the creator. There is a God and he is over all things. The second point was that God sustains us. He, he doesn't need anything from us. He, he's, he doesn't require our praise and our worship. He doesn't require us to feed him. He doesn't require us to build an altar or to make a monument. He sustains us. Not the other way around. Because he is God. Do you hear the philosophical approach here? If God is omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent, he doesn't need us, we need him. He cannot be tamed or created or manipulated. His third point is that God is sovereign over the nations, that God set them in place and created them through one man, that all the peoples on earth came from God's one man with a purpose, that they might seek God and that they might find him. And God is the father of humanity. He borrows a little bit of the um, philosophical poets here. The, the reference was to Zeus. Paul says, no, 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 your poets are right. Our God is the father of us all. You just got the wrong one. There's a relationship here. It, it's a true statement. We are... The children of God, we are like God. And, and Paul does this really incredible thing with Imago Dei, the image of God. He kind of reverses it. He's making a defense of, of his faith, but he says, look, we're made in the image of God. So if you know what I look like, you understand what God looks like. And I'm not made of gold and silver and brick and stone. I am flesh and intellect and all of these other attributes that God shares. If you've seen me, you know what God looks like. And it's not in the idols. It's not in the altars. And then Paul says God will judge the world through his chosen one. God has, has allowed the ignorance to go on, but, but here's the thing. God's calling you to repent, and he's going to judge the world. The end of all things will come. And he has proven his authority by raising this one man from the dead. And Paul proclaims the truth. It wasn't offensive. It wasn't judgmental, meaning that he, he wasn't condemning them. He was invited to speak and he said, this is what is true. Can I, can I borrow Peter's words here instead of Paul's? And Peter says it this way, in your hearts, Set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ would be ashamed of their slander. Paul preached the truth because in his heart, Christ was Lord. He was distressed by the things that were distressing to the Lord. He was moved to action. He was moved to their turf and their territory and he preached the truth because of what had happened in his own life. He was reasonable. He was polite. He was gentle. He was respectful. And he preached the truth. So let me ask you, some questions to, uh, for application. As we wrap up today, I, I'm going to ask you four questions. The first one is this. What grieves you? When you look around, what do you see that stirs in your soul? 
I'm not talking about, you know, um, I'm, I'm talking about the gospel. When you look around your culture, when you look and see the idolatry that happens in, in our culture, what is it that grieves you? Is it the things of God? Uh, I was really challenged last week by Blake's sermon. Uh, many of you were too. I've, I've heard you talk about it. He made the statement that what makes you angry is probably your idol. So let me ask you, I don't want to know what makes you angry. I want to know what grieves you, what provokes you to action, what stirs in your soul when you look around our community and our culture. What stirs you may be your mission. Where is the gospel missing around you? Second question is this, who can you reach? We spend a great deal of resources sending others to share the gospel around the world. In just a moment, you're going to hear from Ethan Greer. He's one of our strategic partners in Japan. And man, from the day God called him and, and his church sent him to Japan, we've gotten to be partners with him. It is a beautiful thing. The, the amount of people who have heard the gospel and who have come in, in a completely lost culture. It's amazing to hear the stories. And we put a lot of resources there and, and, and we send people like Ethan so that we don't have to go learn Japanese and, and all that. I mean, he's worked very hard. And, and, and so you're involved in missions. You're involved in, in, in the mission because you're partners. We spend a lot of our resources with organizations that, that prepare gospel presentations and materials for missionaries to use. And, and you give to that, and that's valuable. But who can you reach? At some level, you've got to be engaged in the gospel personally. Who can you meet on their turf for the sake of the gospel? Maybe it's where you work. Maybe in, in the route that's next to yours or in the cubicle that's next to yours or in the office that's down the way from yours or the person that you sit with in the break room to have lunch. Maybe they're the ones that are your mission that you need to meet on their turf and to engage in dialogue. Maybe they're the ones who need to hear about Jesus. Maybe it's your neighbors. You know, you like the people on the right, but the people on the left are lost. Maybe you need to stop. You're cutting the grass on Saturday and engage in conversation. When you stop in the street to catch up, to talk about Jesus, maybe it's the folks you travel with to play ball or, or cheer or the people that you just hang out with. Who is it that you can meet on their turf. Are you prepared to share the truth? And here's an interesting thing about this whole um, dialogue and, and the presentation and the defense of the gospel in Athens. Um, there are two places that Paul goes in the region of Achaia. It's Athens and Corinth. And he talks about Corinth as the first fruits of his ministry, not Athens. He went to Athens first. I, I don't see a whole lot of converts here. What Dr. Luke tells us is that there were two. Dionysius, um, church history tells us, was the first bishop of Athens. That the church started in his home. That he was the leader of the church. Well, well sure, there were only two people that were converted. One of them's got to be the leader. I don't see a, a tremendous move of the Spirit in, in, in rescuing lost people in, in, this, in, in this think tank. And yet Paul stood and he proclaimed the truth of the gospel. Regardless of what the results would be, when God called him to share and to defend the faith, he stood and he shared the truth. Do you know your testimony? You ever written it down? You ever practiced sharing your testimony? If somebody asked you for the TED Talk that is your faith, Tell me how you came to know Christ. Could you share that truth? 
would you share that truth? And that leads me to the fourth question. If you would not, is Jesus Lord of your life? Let me pray for you. So Lord, we are grateful for the story of the Mars Hill discourse. We're grateful for the words of Paul in defending the faith. Lord, I'm grateful for the example that Paul gives of of sharing faith and defending faith in every setting at all times, always prepared to give a reason for the hope that he had. God, I pray that you would move us, that you would stir us by what we see in our culture, that you would use us to engage people where they are and that you would speak truth through us, through our story of the gospel. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.
proclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow. brought us out with the blood of Jesus. You've given us new life. You've given us freedom. All because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. So God, we're so grateful. We're so amazed at your love for us in this gospel. And God, we say all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Y'all can go ahead and have a seat. Like Tim said, my name is Ethan. Uh, I work with Mustard Seed Network in Japan, and so I, my family and I are, are here visiting. And we've been—we're in a city called Sendai, doing church planting there. Um, we've been in Japan for about 10 years. It'll be 10 years in March, and we've been able to partner with you uh, for that whole time. So I'm really grateful for all of you. I'm really grateful for this church. It's really good to be able to work with you. We are working together. Uh, in Japan, and uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, in 2021, we, well, in 2020, we moved to Sendai, and then in, in 2021, we began public worship there as a church, and so this church plant will be three years old this Easter. Um, today, we, I get to celebrate the Lord's Supper with all of you, and I'm really glad I get to do that. So I want to read Revelation chapter 5 together read the whole thing. So here we go. It says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? 
no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Uh, Revelation is full of uh, a lot of things that are kind of confusing, and, and uh, there's lots of debate about those. One of those debatable things is this scroll. And uh, one idea is they, they look at this and they say it's written on both sides. Well, there's um, another document in the Bible that's written on both sides is the Ten Commandments. And that is the Old Covenant. So maybe this scroll, this is the New Covenant. And so what that would mean is that Jesus, through his death, substitutionary death and resurrection, is opening and putting into effect the new covenant. And Jeremiah 31 talks about the new covenant, and it says that it is, what it is is forgiveness of sins and new hearts for God's people. So when Jesus died, he was the lamb who was slain to pay the price for the sins and the salvation of his people. And he bought people from every tribe and language and people and nation. In Matthew 26, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper with his disciples. I'm going to read that also. Uh, he teaches the same thing about himself here. Matthew 26, starting in verse 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Because Jesus did that, because he died on the cross, because he rose from the dead, because he ransomed people for God, he is worthy of the worship of all peoples throughout the whole earth. And that, that's actually the motivation for missions, and that's the motivation for you to evangelize your neighbors and your friends and your coworkers. He's worthy of of their worship. There is a man I met through one of our church members in, in Sendai. His name is Ishiyama. Ishiyama-san. He, uh, this past year was a really horrible year for him. Uh, his daughter and then his wife both passed away from cancer very close to one another. Um, he heard the gospel through those situations. He heard the gospel through various people one of them being this church member, um, and then I was able to, to follow up with him on that. On December 31st, uh, he was baptized. He, he's an 80-year-old man. He's, he's an elderly man. Um, he confessed faith in Jesus. He was baptized. That was the first day that he'd ever been to church. Um, all those 80 years beforehand, 
not heard the gospel. And so it was really great. After he was baptized, we got to share the Lord's Supper together as family. He didn't know God. He didn't know God's people, but now he's redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. He's one of our brothers. Let's pray and, and thank Jesus and praise him for that. Jesus, you are worthy of all of our worship. You are the lamb who is slain and you have risen and you have ascended to the right hand of the Father and you will return and make all things new. And we praise you for that. It's in your name we pray, amen.
that is we believe that is true that he is alive and because of that truth he is worthy as you have heard today we believe he is worthy of of our praise and praise across the globe and by way of that thought um, it leads right into one of the announcements we want to make for you today And, and this is a Oaxaca mission trip is coming up this summer. It's on the calendar, and we want to know if it should be on yours. As we've talked about the fact that he is worthy, and, that, and not just worthy big picture, but for you personally. And talking through the idea of, of you having a testimony of, of Jesus meeting you personally, and your willingness to share that near and far. So maybe this is something you should consider. On July 20 through 27th, Oaxaca mission trip, and there's an information meeting on February 18th um, after the second service. So if you're interested in the Oaxaca mission trip um, in July, we invite you to come to this informational meeting on February 18th. The next and last announcement is this. Um, We have a Connect Central class coming up on February 25th. And what that is, is an opportunity for you. If you are a regular tender or a a guest, you can come find out more about who we are and what it means to place your fellowship, to be a member here at Central. And as we've been gathering these information cards that we've been hounding you about the last several weeks of getting your information, um, what we found out is, as many of you have said, I'm I'm a regular tender or I'm a guest. And we just want to say we would love for you to make this home we would love for you to take that step of saying, I'd like to be accountable to Central. I'd like Central to be accountable to me and to call this your church home. And so if that's the case, if you've been a regular attender, if you're a guest, you're invited to the Connect Central class at 1030 a.m. on February 25th. With that, I invite you to, to pray one more time with me and then we'll be dismissed. Holy Father, we do want to proclaim that you are worthy. And we want to admit that there are times in our life that doesn't look like that's the case for us, that we don't see that, that we don't proclaim that, that we don't recognize it. And so we ask that today is a day that reminds us of that truth, exposes that truth maybe for the first time. God, would your Holy Spirit prompt us again and again? Would your presence be real in our lives to the fact that we can see you moving and that we can know you personally? God, thank you for that truth. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for salvation. And thank you for your church here and far. God, we we praise you for an opportunity to be together, to take time from the, the normalcy of our week to put our focus on you. We praise you again. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. We'll see you next week.